you for the prayers. I am definitely feeling much better. I am very thankful. It's very typical, like everything else, you appreciate something so much more when it's not available, and I'm much very thankful for my health. Uh, still got a bit of a cold, but who cares? Um, unfortunately, our projector is going the way of the culture. It's gone green. Uh, the bulb decided it's on its way out, and so things are going to look a little green. Should blend in with my face quite well, though, so hopefully that's not an issue. Uh, yeah, uh, part of the curse. You can take your Bible this morning, open up to Matthew chapter 7 once again, as we continue working our way through the Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to begin with reading an illustration uh, from Chuck Swindoll, who uh, is a radio preacher. He's a pastor down in Dallas. He's got a program called Insight for Living. He tells a story about a friend who <clears throat> attended a get-together in the elegant home of a physician in the area of Miami, Florida. Uh, hors d'oeuvres were served with Swindoll's friend, and he thought they were delicious. He kept coming back for more. The doctor's wife was serving meat, quote, on delicate little crackers with a wedge of imported cheese, bacon chips, and crackers of the, uh, and an olive topped with a, silver, a sliver of pimento. She served these morsels on a beautiful silver tray. The wife had just graduated from gourmet cooking course, and she decided she would put her skills to the ultimate test. She wanted to see if she could dress up something that people would not normally eat, have them eat it. Imagine the surprise of her friends when they discovered that the meat served on the crackers with a wedge of imported cheese, bacon chips, and olive top with a silver pimento was dog food. Ouch. What's the point of the story? What does it illustrate? You make something look good enough and taste good enough and people can be fooled. And so, and this is unfortunately very true when it comes to Christianity in our day. Uh, there are Throughout our land and throughout the world, there's various de denomination, denominations under the umbrella of Christendom <clears throat> who have people standing in the pulpits that are maybe very sincere and yet are, I can say, based on the authority of Scripture, are deceivers. They're leading people astray. They're actually working for God or Satan and not God. <clears throat> and this is a tragedy. You know, I read a stat here recently where on average 150,000 people die every day. Um, that's less than two one-hundredths of a percent of the world population, and more people are being born, so the population of the world is actually increasing. But 150,000 people, that sounds awful. And death is awful, but that's not the real tragedy from the standpoint that realistically everybody dies. You and I, apart from the rapture, are going to die. Hebrews 9.27 tells us it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. The greater tragedy is that the overwhelming majority of people who die enter a Christless eternity, well, which will one day find its ultimate expression in the lake of fire, where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth in per perpetuity. You know, Jesus mentioned, as he brings his sermon to a close here, he's Spent, we've spent since chapter 5 going through this sermon, and now it's at the apex. He's calling on his listeners to make a decision with the information he's given. In verse 13, he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. <clears throat> there are many on that broad road that leads to destruction. And yet in some ways the greater tragedy, relatively speaking, is that some of these folks that are on the broad road think very sincerely that they're serving God. I mean, obviously dying and going to hell is as bad as it gets, but thinking you were serving God and on your way to heaven makes it even all the more tragic. Tragedy is not an untimely death in the sense that, again, all of us are going to die. It's a Christless eternity, which is enhanced in terms of the tragedy by these false teachers that have duped the masses into thinking that, again, they represent God and what they're giving them is the word of God and yet it's not according to the word of God and has the opposite effect. 
You know, those who even follow false teachers can be very sincere in their own minds and actually believe they are serving God. Imagine when they wake up in hell. A grim thought. <clears throat> but this is what she, we should expect. Satan is the master deceiver. His only objective is to steal and to destroy and to ruin. And yet, in order to be effective, his emissaries need to transform themselves into what the Bible calls us will seek angels of light. Jesus said in Matthew 24, he said, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. That is the reality. And this was true when Jesus Christ walked on the earth. It's true today. It'll be especially enhanced during the tribulation period when deception will be at an all-time high. But it's really been that way since the Garden of Eden. And it's going to continue that very way. There's no shortage throughout the world of false teachers. And we're going to see a warning that our Savior gives regarding that very issue. Again, as he's coming to the close of this sermon, he's calling for an appeal. And he's going to do so by presenting two choices to the listeners. And presenting a series of contrasts. There's two ways. There's two trees and representative two types of teachers, true and false. There's two professions. And there's two foundations. One is right and the rest are wrong. That's just the way it is. And so, again, <clears throat> I've mentioned this several times, but since the word of God is alive and powerful, it always demands a response. You cannot remain neutral. The design of the word of God is it exposes your heart at a very deep level. Either you're responding positively to the truth and you're being set free by that truth, or you have a negative response and you remain in bondage to untruth. And when it comes to salvation, which is Christ, is, that's what he's after here in this passage, the stakes couldn't be any higher. Amazing. Either you're going to enter in the narrow gate, which leads to a narrow lay, which leads to life, or you're going to stay on a broad road, which you're born on, and go to destruction. So how does one enter the narrow gate? Now we saw last time that it's narrow because the conditions are by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Not all roads lead to heaven. In fact, when Jesus began this survey, in fact, Christ said he is both the gate and the way. In John 10, 9, it could be translated, I am, Jesus said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Notice he is the only entrance. It will come in and out and find pasture. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's it. That is your only option. And when he began this sermon, he said a number of things, but when he was really trashing the Pharisees, if you will, and exposing them for their false teaching, he said, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is imperfect, which should have trumpeted out to all those there saying, you know what, you're in trouble here. You're not perfect. You're far from it. And that was the point of that service. To, or the sermon was to show that if you're going to be righteous before God, there's nothing inherent in you that makes you righteous. You're going to have to get a righteousness that's outside of you and have it put to your account to be made acceptable through God. And because that's the case, God in his mercy offers what we call a great exchange. <clears throat> He's willing to take your sin in exchange for his righteousness, the very righteousness you need to go to heaven. This is communicated in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he, God, made him Christ who knew no sin. He was sinless. He was God who became a man. Completely and perfectly fulfilled the law in every respect. And he chose to be sin for us in our stead. To what end? That we might become the righteousness of God. Notice, in Christ. When you're in Christ, you're righteous. It's a settled issue. You're now fit for heaven. And the way that that happens is because Jesus paid a debt he didn't owe because we had a debt we could not pay. As sinners before holy God, we're separated from him. There's nothing we can do to remove our sin. All the good works in the world isn't going to change the fact that you're a sinner. And it's unacceptable in terms of paying off sin. God doesn't want it because it doesn't work. Try buying something with monopoly money. They're not going to accept it because it's unacceptable. Same principle. And yet on the cross of Christ came Christ, who became sin for us, took God's anger, judgment, punishment, and wrath, and hatred to sin all upon himself. He was dying in your place. 
He was paying for your filth and my filth. In fact, when you come to understand that, salvation is realized when you realize Jesus Christ died for my sins. Not just the sins of the world, but my sins. My sin put him there. My sin he was paying for. He cried out on that cross, it is finished. That means paid in full. And we can illustrate it this way. This is what happens during the transaction of salvation. We're born in Adam. We're born unrighteous. We're born in sins. And there's nothing we can do to remove those things. In fact, because we're in this condition, we deserve the ultimate punishment for sin, which is going to be, again, realized in hell. But God in love provided a Savior, a perfectly righteous Savior. And the whole message of the gospel is that he took upon himself your sins. He was buried. He rose again, proving that God accepted his payment for your sins. And the moment you trust him and him alone as your only means of salvation, it's his righteousness you're trusting. It's his work you're trusting. Nothing in and of yourself. God takes that righteousness and puts it to your account. So you're now accepted in the beloved one. You're accepted freely in Christ through simple faith in him. That's the good news of the gospel. That's the only message that will save you from hell. Anything else you want to add to the mix ruins the whole thing and will not get it done. This is why salvation is by grace. Ephesians 2, 9, 8 and 9 tell us, By grace you're saved through faith. Grace is undeserved kindness. It's a gift from God. Every gift you've ever received is offered to you freely. You accept it freely. Someone else paid for it or someone else made for it. Someone else put the effort into it so you could have it for free. And that's why it's not of you. It's not of works. If you could get there by being good, then Christ wasted his time. And the issue is faith. You're saved through faith. Faith means trust. The issue is trusting Christ and him alone. And salvation is then yours. And so when we say grace, we're saying that God saves according to unmerited favor, nothing you deserve, you're unworthy, you have no ability whatsoever to save yourself, you can never, never, never earn it in any way, it's free, and there's no obligations, no strings attached. And that should cause you to rejoice this morning. It's a free gift. Works, however, means you're trying to earn it, you're earning it like a wage. Works means, I think I'm deserving of this. I've done my part. I've put in my time. I've done what I th think is required. God should look approvingly upon me, see that I'm not as bad as others might think I am or, or whatever it might be. And yet God, you believe that in, in when you're trying to earn it, that God will save you in part because you've maintained your end of the bargain. There's nothing to maintain. There's nothing you can do to take away your sin. You believe you'll merit at least part of your salvation because of your worthy, continued faithfulness, and this sadly will send you straight to hell. This is why this is so important. The issue is will you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? It's through faith in him alone that results in salvation. And so either you're approaching salvation today from the perspective that it's a divine accomplishment, you recognize your sinfulness, you put your trust in Christ alone, and what he's done, or you have the religion of human achievement, where you believe you're good enough, or whatever criteria you think you must meet, and that God will accept you. And if that's the way you're thinking, I want you to know that verse 13 is true of you. You are on the broad road that leads to destruction. That's it. You know, it's sad enough that many people don't consider Jesus' command to enter in, which is an aorist imperative, which means... There's some urgency to it. Do it. Do it now. But this is what's sad is there's so many people that are ignorant of the message. More and more I come across people that have never heard of the gospel message at all. They're oblivious to the provision of grace made by the Savior. On the other hand, more and more I'm coming across people that couldn't be any more indifferent to the message. They've been duped into thinking that it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter that there's no God or whatever it might be. And then there's others that are lost because of the various false religions and vain philosophies that they embrace. We have a tremendous responsibility, as Mike alluded to in his prayer, to sharing this message. And I'm trusting the Spirit of God to work in your heart so that you recognize those who you rub elbows with are on the broad road that leads to hell and need to hear this message. But what's even more sad is that there's so many people that have heard of Jesus that are in all kinds of churches this morning where they're hearing a message that includes Jesus, but it's been distorted to the point where if they embrace it, they're going to hell. 
That's extremely sad. So again, the first command whoops, we've seen here is to enter through the narrow gate. That's what verse 13 is. Enter through the narrow gate. And now, in verses 15 and following, we have a second command. Verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. And every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. The second command here given by the Savior relative to the information he gave in this sermon is to beware of false prophets. Beware of false prophets or teachers. The word beware here is prosecco. Originally, the word meant was followed by the word in the mind, but at times the mind was omitted, but still the idea of the mind was implied. It means to apply self to, to attach oneself to. It was used not figuratively, but literally to moor a ship so that it would remain on its course. But figuratively, the idea is to hold one's mind before, then to take heed, to pay attention, to give heed, to be a state of alertness, to watch out for, to be on guard. That's what the word came to mean. So the word implies the giving of one's consent as well as one's attention. And throughout the New Testament, this is used to warn of danger, mostly spiritual danger. It's not simply a call to notice something, but to be on guard against it because it is so harmful. And so this is a Present tense, be on a state of readiness to be aware of danger and respond appropriately. And so what are you to be aware of? What's the big deal here? Beware of false prophets. Now, if you can see here, you know Greek at all, suedo prophetes is the word here. Suedo means false, prophetess, it means false prophets. And those are those who teach any other way than our Lord is clearly marked out in this passage. These men claim to be a prophet from God and utter falsehoods under the name of divine instruction. <clears throat> now, when you word, the word prophet there is used in, in two ways in our Bibles. Uh, it describes someone who can tell the future from God, but it was also used to describe anyone who spoke God's word to people. They were forth tellers and they were, they were truth tellers and forth tellers and so forth. And so Jesus here is using it to those who would teach the word of God, and in this context, he's really slamming the Pharisees once again. He's warning them about the Pharisees. And if you know your Bible, you recognize that false teachers and false prophets have been a problem throughout the history, the biblical history. There's all kinds of warnings. You know, when Moses, going through the law, and this is where he addressed the nation before they went into the promised land, he says, but the prophet who speaks the word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. How much patience did Jesus have for false prophets? Not much. You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. And there's all kinds of warnings regarding these things. And you see, one of the reasons people were led astray by false teachers is they didn't heed the warnings that were given, like, for example, through Moses to the nation and others. They just didn't give heed. They didn't, they didn't care all that much. In fact, this word Sato prophets in the Septuagint <clears throat> occurs in the book of Jeremiah a fair amount, and if you're familiar with Jeremiah, he repeatedly and again and again, starting in chapter 5 and running through chapter 23, marks the false prophets, warning after warning, and they hated him for it, and he was mistreated horribly because he told the truth that they didn't like. Amazing. And so Jesus says you need to beware of these false prophets. What do we know about these false teachers? How are they described? It says, well, first of all, they come to you. They come to you. 
They're on the prowl. They're chasing after you. You know, it reminds me of what Paul said regarding false teachers to Timothy in the last book that he penned. In describing these false teachers, he says they have a form of godliness. They look kind of good on the outside, but they, they're shams. They deny its power. Such people turn away. For this is the sort who are creeps. Notice, they creep into households and they make captives of gull of a woman loaded down with sins. Led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And you had Janus and Jammers, they resisted Modus, so do these also resist the truth. They're false teachers. They're men of corrupt minds, disapproved concerning the faith. Serious stuff. And they have a message that is palatable, a message they want you to embrace, but it's not true. It's part of the message that is preached on the broad road that leads to destruction. What else do we know about them? Not only do they come to you, but they come to you, and it says here, in sheep's clothing. Sheep's clothing. They look like someone that you should be able to trust, is the idea here. You know, sheep, on the account of their characteristics, are used as emblems of believers in Christ. Now, when some, the typical individual who reads this thinks that they come looking like sheep. But then they'd be, they'd be proverbial wolf in sheep's skin. The more I've looked at this, the more I believe it's in reference. They don't come looking like one of the sheep, but they come looking like a shepherd. They come appearing as one that's supposed to be a protector of the flock when the fact that, that they exploit the flock. See, the word clothing here doesn't refer to an animal skin, but a garment made from fiber, in this case that of a sheep, wool. It's the same word used in Matthew 3, 4 that describes John the Baptist. It says having clothing made of camel's hair. It wasn't camel's skin, but it was hair from a camel that was woven into a garment. That's what John the Baptist wore. Makes me start itching as I think about it. And you know, a person's trade was often identified by what they wore, especially in these days. And the prophets often wore rough, hairy garments like John the Baptist. And false prophets would actually put on this clothing in order to look like they were coming from God. See, most people think it's this, but it's actually this. A wolf found that shepherd's clothing worked even better. What do you know? Remember, Satan is the master deceiver. But notice what Zechariah says. Also, it will come about in the day that prophets will each be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies, and they will put on a hairy robe in order to deceive. In other words, they're going to come dressed like they're supposed to so that their message is believable. That is the idea. And shepherds in this day wore clothing made from sheep's wool, and a false shepherd would wear similar clothing, so he looked like a true shepherd to the flock. And so they'd be more readily accepted by the flock. And again, we're compared to sheep, and sheep, we know empirically, aren't the brightest animals on the planet. But in order for a false teacher to have some credibility in the eyes of the sheep, there needs to be an appearance of something that resembles the truth. And so they're externally, they're going to appear as such that they look the part. You know, the best deception always has some element of logic and oftentimes elements of truth in it. That's why it's deceitful. And so they come looking like shepherds. And what's the third way they're described? But internally, they're ravenous wolves. <laughs> ravenous wolves. The word ravenous is a Greek word harpox. From harpazo, it means to seize and catch away. It means to grasp it. They're, they're grasping for your throat. This word was used to describe a certain kind of wolf and also of grappling irons, which ships were boarded in naval battles. It describes a spirit in which grasps that to which it has no right with a kind of savage ferocity. Interesting, huh? And in Palestine during this time, wolves were the most common natural enemy of sheep. They were known for being merciless and ferocious. They roamed the hills and the valleys looking for a sheep that strayed from the flock or lagged behind. And, of course, they'd rend it to pieces. That's what wolves do. And that's what false teachers do, though, on the outside, they don't look at it. 
See, if false shepherd doesn't come to be part of the flock, but to lead the flock as the shepherd, and so they're dangerous because their goal is not to feed the sheep, but to feed off the sheep to their own selfish ends. But they play the part well. They don't come, you know, they don't wear a name tag that says, Hi, I like to, I'm Reverend Wolf, or whatever it might be. That's, what part, that's part of what makes them so dangerous. They come dressed as shepherds. Someone you can trust. They appear to be trustworthy. They can quote the Bible. But they take it out of context, and they prey on unlearned sheep. They pervert the truth to their own selfish ends. And so you need to be aware of these things. Now let me give you some balance here. You know, in speaking, as there's repeated warnings throughout your New Testament to recognize false teachers, you also need to recognize that there's people that mean well that are simply in error what they believe. And we, can, we need to discern who's a false teacher and who we can help. Some people just don't understand things as clear as they could, and they just need things better explained to them. And this is actually true of Apollos. A certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, but he was incomplete. He only knew the baptism of John, so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. It's not like he was negative, and he was seeking to distort the truth, to gain his own converts. He just needed a little clarification. And so wisdom is needed here. But that's not the kind of person Jesus is talking about here. These are individuals who intentionally raise themselves up as teachers and spokespeople for God. They say they're speaking the truth. In fact, they're preaching false doctrine and lead people astray. They're perverting the grace of God. And again, they may be very convincing. They may be very sincere. They might be really, really nice. But they're doing the devil's work. In fact, a friend of mine who I've had many discussions about spiritual things, and, and he comes to me with questions all the time. Uh, came to me, his niece, who was raised in the church, got sucked into the Jehovah Witnesses. And, you know, we gave him all kinds of things to talk to her, and she wouldn't listen to anyone. And the reason that she got sucked in is because these people acted like they really cared about her, where she didn't feel that way in the church. And so she was right because all cults prey on the vulnerable, it's exactly what they do. She was vulnerable. They preyed on her, and she is in with bells on now. Why? They were really, really nice. Really nice. You know, Peter warns us there were also false prophets among the people. In the past, there's going to be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. It's not like it's easy to spot necessarily if you're not on guard or not trained in the truth, even denying the Lord about them, and they could bring on themselves swift destruction. But notice, many will follow their destructive ways. Ha, what a sad statement. Because of whom the way of truth, the Christianity will be blasphemed. That's what false teachers do. They make a bad name for Christianity. People always point to someone they have no business pointing to to justify the rejection of Christianity. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Notice, all false teachers do is exploit their people. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. You know, this word ravenous is translated swinder or extortion or every other time it appears in the New Testament. For example, the Pharisee, stood and prayed with himself, I thank God that I'm not like other men. Oh, it doesn't work today. Extortioner. That's exactly what he was. Unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. He was blind to his own depravity. But they take advantage of the sheep. They take from them to satisfy their own selfish desires. Their concern is themselves, not of the sheep. It might be money, it might be a sense of power and control, it might be fame, it might be all those things, but the bottom line, it's all about them, and it's not about the Lord. 
They'll talk about Jesus, they'll use the scriptures, but it'll all be twisted in a way that's inaccurate. In fact, notice what Jude said. And notice the word here. It says, certain men have crept in unnoticed. Unnoticed. Who long ago were marked for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Unnoticed. And Jesus is actually warning people again to not listen to the message of the Pharisees in this context. Now, in our day, look at, you know, Paul, the last thing he said to the Ephesian elders. This is so sad to read. He says, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, talking to the elders here, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, and they won't spare the flock. Here's the really sad part. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up. Speaking perverse things, to what end? And this is what it is, to draw away disciples after themselves. So you watch. You remember. For three years I didn't cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. This is a big deal. Night and day with tears. Oh, come on, Paul, you're overreacting. Oh, really? You know, I've been saved almost going on 40 years, and I've seen this happen more Several times. This is not, this is a big deal. What did John say? For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves, think people, that we not lose those things which you were for, but we are going to receive a full reward. In other words, don't get sucked in and get doctrinally screwed up and lose the reward you could have. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ doesn't have God. Whoever abides in the doctrine of Christ is both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, don't even receive him into your house. Don't greet him. You're sharing in his evil work. Well, that's kind of strong. I mean, come on, these are, these are my friends. I've lost friends because I've stood on the truth. Because... I've got the problem in their mind. What did Paul say to the Corinthians who were vulnerable because they were carnal? But I fear lest somehow as the serpent CD by his craftiness, so you boneheads, your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. For if he comes to you and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you might even put up with it. This is how whacked they were in their thinking. Well, that would never happen to me. I mean, you think God would have to tell us this once, but it's all over the place. Beware, take heed, look to yourselves. But the good news here, according to our passage, is that false teachers are knowable by their fruit. They're recognizable. Verse 16, you will know them by their fruits. They're knowable. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. Bad tree bears bad fruit. Good tree can't bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. This is how the Amplified Bible translates this verse. You will fully recognize them. That's what the Greek word means. They're fully recognizable. How? By their fruits. Do people pick grapes from thorns and figs from thistles? Weist, in his Greek translation, says, for their fruits will clearly recognize them. They do not gather up grapes from bramble bushes or figs from prickly wild plant or, or thistles, do they? You know, apparently in Jesus' day, and I can't verify this, but there was a certain thistle called a buckhorn, and bore black berries that looked like grapes. There was a certain thistle that had a flower, and that flower from a distance looked like a fig. But obviously, if you bit into them or... Whatever, you'd realize, no, that is not what they claim to be. And you know what? Only grapes, grapevines produce real grapes. Only fig trees produce real figs. The nature of the tree determines its fruit. And so he says here very clearly, a good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. So, 
What does the fruit mentioned here refer to? It's a legitimate question, right? Do you know what almost every commentary I have says? How they live their life. Guess what? That's not what it means. I'll just give you a sampling. Fruits, it's Greek word karpos in this context. First to ones, I can't underline it. Manner of life. What a person does. First to more than who they are, individuals are. How they behave. For they can say the right things and deceive saints who have not obeyed Jesus' command to be continually on guard. Character is satisfactorily tested by its fruit. It's not the outward appearance that is important, but the things these false prophets do. The produce, so to speak, of their thought, words, and deeds. Wrong. It goes on to say the same commentary. Here's Jesus' key point. If we take note of what these false prophets do, and it's their emphasis, and refuse to be charmed and enamored by their false words and their gold oratorical skills, we will recognize for what they are, what they teach, how they conduct themselves, their lifestyle, their conduct in general. The emphasis in every one of them, and I can't even tell you how many are, is how they live their life. You know, what's really sad, it's amazing how com commentaries can be whacked. There's some people who want to use these verses to determine if someone is truly saved. You'll know them by their fruits. That's not even the context here. It has nothing to do with salvation. It has everything to do with who's a false teacher. He's talking about how you can spot a false prophet. And the issue is not their behavior. How do we know that? Well, what did Paul say? For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. They look good, people. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. They look good. You can't go by their behavior. The indicator of a false teacher is the message he brings. It's the message he brings. In fact, I'm going to let Jesus interpret this. Go to Matthew chapter 12. Uses the same motif, if you will. Verse 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Same principle. You brood of vipers. Easy, Jesus. You brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, notice the words, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. An evil man, and the context here is false teaching again, out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified. And by your words you will be condemned. Oh. Again, using the same imagery, but the issue is the words they spoke. Let's go to Matthew 16. Notice verse 6. Then Jesus said to them, his disciples here, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Two religious groups. And we'll see here the leaven means they're teaching. And they reason among themselves, saying, Because we have taken no bread, they're thinking literally. Jesus is speaking figuratively. Jesus, being aware of it, said, Oh, you guys, you guys, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do, not you, do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Neither the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? How is it you not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Then they understood he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. There it is.
What did Jesus say in Luke 12? In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. See, the only way you can fully determine or know whether Bible teachers are good or corrupt inside is by the message they preach. If they bring a message that is not clear about salvation and the grace of God and eternal security, they're a false prophet. It's not the fruit that makes the tree good. It's the goodness of the tree that makes the fruit good. And Jesus is talking in the context of salvation, entering through the gate. You know, that's why we seek to be clear here. And this is why we'll say this is how you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And we'll tell you how you're not saved. Praying a prayer, walking them out, repenting of your sins, whatever that means. is. Every seems every preacher defines it differently, and it's not even in the Bible. There's boatloads of false teachers out there today. They're presenting a wide gate and a broad road that leads to destruction. I mean, how many think if they just love their neighbor, that's all you need to do, you're going to go to heaven? Or just try your best with the Ten Commandments? Or live morally. Or just give money to me. Or whatever it might be. Or to the church. Or just keep doing good works. Or wait a minute, you've been baptized and confirmed. You're in. You're in. A lot of false teachers don't even bring up the concept of heaven and hell. Hey, we're all a child of God here, man. Let's just, you know, don't get your undies in a bunch here. We're all fine. Heaven and hell are myths. The love of God will not permit anyone to go to hell. Come on. Sin is not, it's just a sick, you know, it has nothing to do with guilt. Get rid of your guilt complex. You're not really responsible for your sins. It's it's someone else's problem. Or the other side of the spectrum, not only, you know, you've got to make Jesus Lord of your life, man. We've got to clean yourself. If If there's not visible fruit in your life, you're not really saved. The list is endless. The list is endless. The word bad there means corrupt, rotten, putrefying. You know what? Bad teaching never delivers a soul from death. Christ said you should know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And the truth is in Jesus. False teaching always appeals to the pride of man. There's always an appeal to look within yourself and to make the grade somehow. And we're easily deceived because of our own pride. Because our own pride gets us to believe that we're something when we're really nothing. And to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. I mean, what did Je- this is true of believers. What did Jesus have to say to the church at Laodicea? Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy, I got need of nothing. What did Jesus say? You idiot. You're blind, you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're naked. You're doing horrible spiritually. I'm doing fine, thank you. And you know what? False teachers, so many false teachers focus on the earthly and the temporal and not the spiritual. They're always appealing in some fashion on the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, which are not of the Father, but of the world. And you have pastors and pulpits peddling that deception everywhere. What did Paul say? Last powerful words he said. He says, I charge you before God the Father and Jesus Christ of whom he's going to judge the living and the dead. You preach the word. You can be ready in season and out of season. You convince, rebuke, and exhort. You do it with all patience, and you do it with teaching. Why? For the time will come, and now is, when they will not enter the sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Because they have itching ears, they're going to heap for themselves teachers, and they're going to turn those teachers, their ears away from the truth, and they're going to be turned aside into fables. You know, when your pride's running the show, your flesh is going to want teaching that appeals to your flesh. I mean, and you know, 
I could go on and on in this, but we don't have time. But, you know, Jesus here is warning these people of the greatest threat to their spiritual well-being. And how many people don't want to hear the truth because it steps on their toes? I mean, I, I, I got to find that one slide again that says, the woman's walking away, she says to the person she's walking with, I like that church. It doesn't upset the way I live. And that's all. That's what people want in the church today. They want to alleviate their conscience by said they warmed a chair in a pew today so everything's good. But, you know, let's not get carried away here. Right? You know, if Jesus walked in, into the, all the churches in Grand Rapids and gave this warning today, he'd be thrown out of the place, most likely. See, the bottom line for a lot of believers today that even know better is not worshiping God in spirit and in truth. That's really not what it is. It's not their bottom line. They really want to live on their own terms, and if God wants to come along and bless their program, well, hey, that's okay, but if he doesn't, eh, that's okay too, because it's really all about me. And we carry that mindset into the church, and so we're not willing to worship him in spirit and in truth because he means everything to me, because that will involve sacrifice, and that will involve, you know, uh, adjustments I really don't care to make. And we can get sucked into that trap. And there's preachers that'll tell you that's the way it should be, so they're thinking, I'm going to that church, man. I'm going right now. I mean, most people throughout their day think about the economy, their personal finance, their own health, their safety, their marital status, their politics, their social values. That's usually where every individual lives on a daily basis. They don't stop and say, you know what, Lord, what would you have me to do today? They'd say, Lord, how can I just live within the parameters that I've set up for myself? Can you help me with that, please? I mean, am I right or am I wrong? It's not that I don't fight that battle. I sure do. I mean, the culture is changing dramatically in our country. And things, realistically, are going to get more and more uncomfortable for you. And how many people I talk to are worried about the election and the government and how we're going to live? You know what? It's going down the tubes. Why don't you think about making hay while you can Let's get some hay in the barn. The answer isn't government. We are so concerned about how the outward things affect us. You know, the outward things could go to hell in a handbasket in five minutes, but that should have no impact on who you are in Christ on the inside. But a false teacher is going to emphasize things differently. And what I just said here is true of most people in the evangelical church. They're concerned about all these things I just mentioned. They're not concerned that their neighbor's going to hell in a handbasket. They're not concerned about this believer struggling over here with this and that, or this believer suffering with this and that. They're the bottom line. And you know, as I think of this passage here, I've come to see, in the years I'm doing this, Many in the evangelical church aren't all that concerned about doctrine. They just aren't. It's not a critical factor in what they consider in attending the church. It's not that they don't care at all, but they just don't care all that much. I mean, uh, you know, I don't know if what he said there was really true, but that's okay here. I like the music here. You know, no one comes here for the music. I get that. But you know what? This place has got really good programs for my kids. Or the pews are really comfortable, and I like this worship band. And, and you know, the, the message is only 20 minutes. Thank God. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, Jesus' emphasis here is on the truth that will set you free and not buying into something that will ruin you for life and even eternity. Are you tracking here? Does this mean anything? Now again, the commentators are all off. Another one. Their unbelievers can only, they say, only unbelievers can produce bad fruit. 
blah, 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 blah. You know, either you're saved by the grace of God, the Spirit of God is directing in you, and you're giving out truth according to the grace of God, or you're something else, in a sense. You know, Paul had to warn, right after that Janus and Jabez, he said, you've carefully followed my doctrine. That was the number one thing Paul mentioned. And you know what? I allow this doctrine to affect how I think, which is the exact opposite of the false teachers. I've had purpose, which it wasn't about me. It was about sacrificing for Christ. I've been willing to long suffer. No false teacher long suffers. It's about love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. You've seen them all, and guess what? I endured them. I had to endure them, but who delivered me? The Lord delivered me, even though I had to endure that's the, you know, a true prophet is going to love the Lord Jesus Christ and, willing, and be willing to sacrifice for the sake of his glory and for the benefit of others. Every false teacher's got it backward. You know, the Creflo Dollar puts out an appeal to his followers so he can buy a new $65 million jet. It's enough to make a billy goat puke. This is not describing believer versus unbeliever. It's describing a false teacher versus a true teacher. And Jesus said every false teacher will eventually be judged. Back to Matthew 7 there. Verse 19. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's a warning for the Pharisees in the immediate context. And it's a warning. That Peter says the same thing in his epistle. All false teachers, it seems when Jude addresses it, when Peter addresses it, it's mentioned that judgment is coming and it's not going to be pretty. Now, does this mean hell? Well, if they're unsaved false teachers, it means hell eventually. This is what John the Baptist said to the Pharisees when they came to get baptized. He says, the axe is already laid to the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Jesus is very long-suffering, but one thing I think makes his blood boil is false teaching. And one day justice will be rendered out. And the stakes are high. You know, every false teacher and false prophet is attack on him because Moses predicted in Deuteronomy 18 that the true prophet was coming after him. Peter declared in Acts 3 that Jesus was the true prophet. So every one of these is a tool of Satan to attack Jesus Christ. And all messages of hope and deliverance apart from faith in Christ alone are false gospels that will ruin people when embraced. And so his conclusion in verse 20 is, therefore by their fruits you will know them. You will know them. In other words, you've got to have a critical discerning ear, know the truth, stand on the truth, and call the false teacher for what he is, a false teacher. Do you see the stakes involved? You know, there's pressure all the time to compromise, all the time. All the time to not make a big deal to hold hands, you know, we're all in this together, let's have a big ecumenical meeting. And I'm not about being a separatist in the standpoint of, I mean, I am what I am by the grace of God, but boy, the stakes are high, aren't they? When I had to give an explanation as to why I don't want to tear the pastor's prayer fellowship to a, a believer I know, I thought I was completely off guard. I said, how can I pray with people? I said, first of all, half these pastors are ladies. That's not biblical. I said, a number of them don't believe in eternal security. A number of them believe in baptismal regeneration. And you want me to pray? I said, we're not even praying to the same person. And they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so if the goal is to worship God, if it isn't true, God isn't honored. I lost a friend right then and there. Because he didn't even have the biblical background and foundation to understand what I was even saying. He thought I was just arrogant. Are the stakes high enough for us to take a stand on the truth and be clear? 
Because how many people have become a twofold child of hell because they've embraced the wrong message? This is Jesus' warning. You beware. And then he's going to clarify it. In verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to, can you? I mean, he's drilling this thing down. Since our goal is to honor the Lord, let's honor the Lord. How important is sound doctrine to you? What's your goal? Do you want to do your own thing and, and nod to God and warm a chair but still do your own thing? Appreciate from a distance the fact that this is truth, but, but are you, or is your goal to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth and to make your life count for the time that he's given you on earth? That's what it comes down to in so many ways. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we are what we are by the grace of God. We're thankful for the warning Jesus gives here. And may we take heed to ourselves. May we take heed to the doctrine that we know is true. May we allow the truth to set us free. And as we grow in the grace and knowledge of you, that our love would be sincere. Sincere for you, sincere for others. That our goal would be to honor you in spirit and in truth. And to seek to help those that are in an error of the ways like Aquila and Priscilla did with Apollos, and, and yet to stand against false teachers who are turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. We thank you, Father, that the Spirit of God is able to do these things, and we thank you that your grace is sufficient for these things, so may we with humble hearts seek to uplift our dear Savior, who is so worthy of our praise. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.